Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about basovertebral nerve ablation. This is kind of a short discussion on this, and then we'll head to the lab for a procedural demonstration. Okay, these are not metastases lined up in a line, right? These are basovertebral nerve ablation zones, and it looks odd. So it, this is something we've seen all the time. The basovertebral nerve, uh, the terminus is right here. The basovertebral plexus is what we call it. The nerve is located right in the plexus. Can I have a show of hands? How many people are doing basovertebral nerve ablation? Wow, really? Anybody? Okay. So last year we did about 52 of these cases. This is for the indications for discogenic back pain, vertebrogenic back pain to be specific. So this is a huge deal, right? It's the greatest cause of disability worldwide, back pain. And back pain, the greatest cause of back pain is discogenic, vertebrogenic back pain. This is, accounts for $200 billion annual expenditures. This is the second number of uh, highest visits to the doctor next to the common cold. And this is a really big problem. And the really big problem is primarily related to the disc and the uh, vertebrae, the implant adjacent to it. And the concept of the difference between discogenic pain and vertebrogenic pain is one that's really come about only recently. What is discogenic pain, internal disc disruption? This is young, healthy, good-looking people like every single person in this room. So, right, average age of people we do, uh, stem cell augmentation for the intervertebral disc that Dr. David will talk about uh, up and coming is 35. BMI 24, average uh, age of people we do changes for discogenic back pain associated with modic changes is 53 in our patient population in the intercept trial. So this is a huge patient population. So you, a lot of things in the back that can cause pain, muscles, facet joints, uh, SI joints um, down lower, but the disc is extremely important. I think uh, we can't confuse uh, internal disc disruption, which is disruption of the annulus and internal annular tearing with vertebrogenic pain. So what we focus on on this is the basovertebral nerve, and this is what gives rise to innervation within the end plate. And this was originally described by Antonacci. He took uh, 69 vertebral bodies and stained for substance P and stained the nerves and found the substance P was contained within the nerves. So the nerves, the basovertebral nerve is a branch of the sinovertebral nerve that comes from the dorsal root ganglion, which is modulates pain. It communicates levels above and level below, two levels above, two levels below, based on the plexus connected to the anterior spinal rami, connected to the dorsal root ganglion by the gray and white rami communicans. So this is all, we talked about DRG modulation, the nerve that comes from the DRG by virtue of the sinew vertebral nerve gives rise to the basovertebral nerve. That's what transmits pain. So you can see how all this interlinks now, right? This is a good physio physiologic anatomic reason why we have pain here. And so what he did is uh, stain these things to say that yes, they're present accounted for. Yes, they're unmyelinated nerves. Yes, they transmit pain. And this is the original work on this, followed by bovine work to demonstrate that this can be done without increasing the risk of fracture. So this is a bipolar burn, and this is burning and targeting the terminus or the end of the basovertebral plexus. And the basovertebral plexus is seen, is seen what I showed you previous, shown right here, that little line is the basovertebral plexus, and the end of it is where you're targeting. And you're targeting more than a centimeter from the posterior wall to avoid burning the, the dura or the epidural space or the, for sure the cauda equina. And you have about a five to six millimeter burn that is neurolytic completely. You have about 10 to 12 millimeters of burn that it's a, at a lower temperature that's incompletely neurolytic. So you're trying to target five to six millimeters of the terminus of the basovertebral nerve that's located approximately 60% posterior from the anterior cortex and halfway up right smack in the middle of the vertebral body. So here's the basovertebral nerve uh, anatomic diagram of this, and here's the axis cannula. So the int introducer cannula is here, 
right? Seven gauge needle. This is followed by a nitinol, nickel titanium, curved um, uh, nitinol, piece of nitinol that's covered by peak polyether either ketone. This is the straight stylet right there. The straight stylet is used to propagate the distance of the curve in case you fall short, for example, in an L5 vertebral body. And then the radio frequency probe on the far left is hooks up to a 20 watt generator and this burns at 85 degrees Celsius for usually about 15 minutes a level. And this is the generator itself. The tool set, the specs on the generator, it's a bipolar burn, and this is what it hooks together. So you access it with the, the needle, take the needle out, the cannula, the stylet out of the cannula, leave the cannula in, put the nitinol covered with the peak through to target the center of the vertebral body. The reason it's curved is because that's about the only way that you can get 60% back right in the middle of the vertebral body. And then once you access that, if you're short, use the straight stylet. If not, you pull it out, put the probe in and burn for about 15 minutes per level. So this is an example of everything. So we start off needle. This is the nitinol, and this is also beveled to facilitate the directional steering capability. This is what you want, right in the middle. And then after you get it in the middle of the vertebral body, about 60% of the way back, right, it's starting to make the curve. Then you put the probe in, and you burn right there, and this is absolutely ideally targeted. And this is what it looks like in fluoroscopy. So, basal vertebral plexus, sometimes it's very well seen when you start looking at this to target it. One thing that you will notice is it is inevitably located 50% of the way up or 50% of the way down from top to bottom. The terminus is almost always 60% of the way back of the vertebral body. The third thing you'll notice is that, at, is that at S1, the basal vertebral plexus is located usually about two-thirds of the way up. It's not located right in the middle of the S1 vertebral body. It's located about a third of the way down or two-thirds of the way up from the bottom of the disc. And here's the channel that you make. This is a L5 that was done, and that's the channel that you make on the far right. And the images, the burn images that you see are located in, uh, in, at the terminus of the basal vertebral plexus, and they look just like that. They're kind of, they look like a bullseye. The center is where the hole is, what fills in later, and followed by the, the difference in temperature of the burn based on distance. So what you're looking for, you're looking for stable discogenic back pain with modic type one or two changes. Modic type one changes are edematous changes. They look like edema adjacent to the end plate. Modic type two degenerative end plate changes looks like fat. Edema or fat. Modic one or modic two, named after our buddy Mike Modic. And this is what you're looking for. This is a pretty easy case. Usually what I'll do is I'll inject anesthetic in the disc, make sure the pain goes away, make sure it's provocatively positive, and then this is an excellent case for stable discogenic back pain treatment of basal nerve ablation. So what about the clinical results? I have the first two level one trials all on one slide here. The first was the SMART trial, 225 patients. Um, Jeff Fiskren was the PI in this one. Uh, and this was compared with sham. So this is a very high level of evidence. And the second trial, the Intercept trial that was just completed, it has 150 patients. This is compared with non-surgical management. The Intercept trial was stopped early in interim analysis for success. And usually when you say stopped early in interim analysis, it's usually due to one of the F words, like failure or futility. So this is actually stopped early because it was so good at the three month time point. The people that were in the non-surgical management arm, the so-called conservative care arm, were placed over, put back in the arm for active treatment, and the study was terminated early for success, a very high bar. The primary endpoint in both of these studies was Oswestry disability improvement. The secondary endpoints, as you'll notice, even in the intercept trial that was, has less than the optimal number of patients, was statistically significantly positive for pain, function, and quality of life. And here's the delta when compared to the intercept trials, a pretty good decrease in back pain. 
One of the things that's interesting about this, and this is from uh, the histology from a bovine model, is that the patients from the SMART trial and some of the early patients that I did on basovertebral nerve ablation, usually what I tell the patients, you get about a 75% response rate meaning 75% of people will get a dramatic reduction in pain and a dramatic improvement in function. And it appears to last three to five years or longer. So the patients we did early on are still going, and this is dramatic. One, the first patient I did was one of my anesthesiologists, and, and he was, you know, told me after the fact, not before, he said, you know, I was almost suicidal, he had back pain so bad. Came in and described it, and, and here's a guy that's watched me do thousands of vertebral augmentation procedures, and even some of these. And I said, well, how are you doing, Gary? He said, well, you know, after hammering those nine penny nails into my back, I'm a little sore, but that back pain I feel that drove me crazy that made me drink whiskey every night is gone. It's gone. And he's still doing it. Sent me, this was years ago, sent me a picture this winter of him, you know, 50 pounds lighter, tearing it up on the slopes in, in, uh, in Colorado. So it's fantastic. And it, it may not grow back, is the point. Most of the nerve ablations that we do, the nerve grows back. Anything with myelin, anything with a perineurium, it grows back because a perineurium is the last thing to go. This, Maybe it's because it's non-myelinated. Maybe it's because the bone grows back. Maybe it will grow back and the, the nerve growth is just very slow. But if you are a responder, it's usually definitive. It's usually the patient can tell it immediately. And usually it's ex either extremely durable or perhaps permanent. And this is, demonstrates this. This is, uh, I showed this from the SMART trial. This is the last slide that I have data on. But speaking to uh, Chief Medical Officer, uh, Ray Baker, who you guys know, Ray says data, same, at three to five years or more. And this was a conversation I had with him uh, two days ago. So this curve goes out, at least from there, does not go up in terms of pain reduction and functional improvement out to that far. So it's highly statistically significant. It's associated with two level one trials that, that have data, <clears throat> one compared with the conventional non-surgical management or the so-called conservative care arm. The other one is, is compared against placebo. So this is uh, exceedingly effective. So what you're looking for is pa patients with stable discogenic back pain that have modic changes. And this is probably, this is where the term vertebralgenic pain comes from. So whenever you have a patient like that, and you can confirm that that's their pain generator, think basovertebral nerve ablation. That's it, and thanks. I'll open it up to questions, comments. Yes? How do you know you're not uh, burning an artery? Well, there is a small artery in there. The basovertebral plexus is a tiny artery and a tiny vein. So one of the early studies was to see what happens. I mean, if you ablate this, are you going to predispose to fracture? Are you going to cause uh, avascular necrosis of the vertebral body? Are you going to do some permanent harm? So long story short, uh, there's a few phase one trials in animals, nothing. Phase two, nothing. Uh, pivotal trials here, nothing. So it appears that there's really not much that you're doing. And remember the segmental arteries that also give rise to branches of the vertebral body comes from the outside. We talked about that in the uh, vertebral augmentation section. And the arteries that occur in here are, are quite small anyway. And you're burning also at the terminus, right? Not, not the, uh, the base. Yeah, Neil. So when you're uh, looking at the young, fit, healthy, how do you uh, run the differential to separate this from the from yep. the Usually I just do it based on, based on disc appearance. So the, the truth is I don't really know how to do it reliably. So if somebody has, so the modified Fearman scale is grade one through eight. Uh, one and two we don't care about because they're normal. Three through six is mild to moderate degeneration or moderate to severe degeneration. Seven or eight is moderate to severe or severe degeneration. So usually I reserve this for grades seven and eight, moderate to severe or severe associated with modic changes. And then anything, Fearman grades three through six, six is moderate degeneration or blackening of the disc, but less than 30% collapse. So I, I, kinda, I do it by the Fearman scale. Having said that, some of our failures, we have a certain non-responder rate <clears throat> to stem cells, and the patients 
from our last trial, the VAST trial, enrolled 55 patients in that. For our non-responder to stem cell, intradiscal stem cells, we took and did basorutebral nerve ablation. All of them responded significantly. So I think it has to do with the fact that we're still having a difficulty really accurately separating discogenic versus vertebrogenic. Did you say you used an anesthetic? Uh, the effect as a determinant? Yes, I use provocative ant. So I inject, instead of injecting a lot of contrast under pressure, I inject lidocaine. I get provocative. Intraosseous? Yeah, in the, in the uh, disc. In the disc? Yeah. And the, the ones with Fearman grade seven or eight with modic changes, goes, it communicates all the way up and down. Yeah, it's not a, not a perfect... Uh, Study. Some people have injected, uh, have tried to inject, for example, Sal Masala out of Rome injected resorbable bone cement in patients with modic one changes, and out of over a thousand patients, found statistically significant reduction in back pain by injecting resorbable bone cement in, in under the end plate. So whether it's a disc or the end plate, it's kind of somewhere in between. And the erosions we get at the, between the junction of the disc and the end plate, the erosions we get with that end plate are probably pain generators. How we best access that, still not quite sure yet. So are you doing discograms as part of the diagnostic? Yeah, I am. Yes, I do. Yes, Mario. How many, how many uh, discs do you ablate at the time? So for each single disc, you ablate the level above and level below. So two ablations, you know, per per disc. And usually we we don't do any more than about two levels at a time. So two discs at a time. Questions, comments, snide remarks. Okay. So we're going to head to the lab and do a demo on BVN ablation. <laughs>